The morning sun rose lazily over a sleepy town in Utah, its light casting a pale glow on the quiet streets. Curtis Green, however, was already wide awake, preparing for yet another day at his unusual job. He wasn't just an ordinary worker, no, Curtis was the administrator for an underground illicit marketplace. As he stared at the dim glow of his laptop screen, he could not help but feel a sense of dread wash over him. The support tickets seemed to never end, piling up in a stream of requests that he was expected to handle. But that was just one of the many downsides of working for the Silk Road. The job also demanded his undivided attention, and it never ceased to drain him, both physically and mentally. But as he was lost in these thoughts, a sudden commotion outside jolted him back to reality. The postal worker was running down the street, and a strange van with no markings was parked nearby. He couldn't shake off the feeling that something was off. Curtis gingerly walked to the door, his chronic pain making every step a struggle. As he opened it, he was greeted with the sight of a small priority box laying at his feet. It was no bigger than a book, but it felt heavier than it looked. Without thinking much more, he took the package inside into the kitchen, where he attacked it with the designated male opening scissors. The package erupted with a plume of white powder. In the blink of an eye, everything turned to chaos. The door exploded off its hinges, and dozens of armed police officers barged in, guns at the ready, guns at Curtis. The box that he'd picked up had been a trap, and he'd fallen right into it. With his heart racing and his mind in a daze, Curtis watched as the agents swarmed around him, their boots coated with the same white powder that had blinded him. It was surreal, like something out of a movie, but for Curtis, it was all too real, and he knew that his life would never be the same again. Carl Force stood by the window, his eyes fixed on the man in the US Postal Service jacket walking by. It was a critical moment, and he couldn't afford any mistakes. If this operation gets blown because of his sneakers and jeans, I'll have his ass, he muttered under his breath. The package, which was now sitting innocently on the porch across the street, contained $27,000 worth of cocaine, and if anything went wrong, it was his life that was as good as over. This, after all, was Carl's operation, one that had spawned from unusual circumstance. When Special Agent Carl Force of the DEA had been offered a place on the Marco Polo Task Force, he didn't take things too seriously. He wasn't well suited for the role. Before long, however, he decided that he could flex his talent for undercover work, even in an online space where he wasn't familiar. He set about creating an alter ego, which he called Knob. The express purpose was to infiltrate the inner circle of the number one drug kingpin in the world, Dread Pirate Roberts, the owner and operator of Silk Road. Carl was living a double life in his search for the pirate captain. He was a special agent of the DEA by day and a narco by night. Despite being responsible for this sting, Carl couldn't help but admire the sheer scale and genius of the Silk Road. It was the fastest growing and most comprehensive illegal marketplace in the world. It was innovative, nothing like it had existed prior. Carl spent countless hours poking through the forums and even talking to DPR. He began to respect the man, whoever he was, maybe even considered him a friend. He felt conflicted at times, whether he wanted the man to escape at the end of all this. But as he watched Curtis Green take the package inside his house, Carl knew that his obsession had to take a backseat to the task at hand. He gave his signal to the dozen or so members of the SWAT team waiting nearby, and it was time. The raid, as he watched, was swift and efficient. How could it not be? An old man in a house by himself, with no idea what was happening. Not exactly an adrenaline-filled mission, and they probably over-prepared. All the same, it needed to be done. Special Agent Carl Force entered the house through the gaping hole where the door once stood stepping on the splinters and looking around at the mess. There was Curtis, laying on the ground, face painted like a clown, though instead of paint, an illegal white powder. There were bigger fish to catch, but first, he needed the bait. He needed Curtis. The world seemed to blur around Curtis as he tried to make sense of what was happening to him. 
He was on the ground, but couldn't remember how he got there. He could hear voices, but not what they said. The ringing in his ears drowned out any coherent thought. After what seemed like an eternity, the situation settled itself somewhat. People around him were talking instead of shouting. No longer were there heavy footsteps coming from the ceiling above. Another man entered the room, wearing a bulletproof vest, but none of the tactical gear of the ones he'd seen so far. Unlike the other agents, this one looked like he belonged on the streets. He had a shaved head, a stocky build, and a hardened look in his eyes. He introduced himself as Special Agent Force, and Curtis could tell from the sour expression on his face that he meant business. As soon as Force began asking him questions, Curtis couldn't help but start rambling. His words tumbling out too fast and too incoherent for him to even remember what he was saying. Incapable of looking at the interrogator's face, he took a loud reprimand with a harsh voice for Curtis to finally snap out of it. He sat there, waiting for instruction, but it didn't come. Looking up at the man revealed a face of utter disgust. At this moment, Curtis knew he had stumbled into something much bigger than himself, and he had a feeling that things were only going to get worse from here. Force had spent a lifetime living amongst hardened criminals. He himself had almost lost his career, his wife, and his child due to his inability to separate real life from the undercover role he often played. The man in front of him was a disgusting sight. Is this the new generation of criminals? Sickly old men who shit their pants at the first sign of trouble, ready to rat out the whole organisation? Force considered this while looking at Curtis blubbering in front of him paying no attention to the words tumbling carelessly out of his mouth. Shut the fuck up for a minute, he said, with a raised voice. Curtis came to an abrupt stop, unable to meet his gaze or even look up from the floor. A means to an end, he thought, a small cog in a much more complex machine. At this moment, an agent came over to where they were now seated, the trap package in his hand. Force held it in front of Curtis. A kilogram of cocaine? Do you know what that means, Mr. Green? That's five years minimum in a federal prison. Though considering your job on the Silk Road, we could push for 20 or more for intent to distribute. That wouldn't matter, of course. You wouldn't last a week in there. Carl knew this last part was unnecessary. The man would talk without any threats. But if he had to suffer through dealing with this man, he deserved at least a little fun. But, of course, if you cooperate with our investigation, we can help you. Your boss, Dread Pirate Roberts, we want you to help us bring him down. Carl studied Curtis. Without needing to reply, compliance was guaranteed. In the following silence, Carl couldn't help but wonder if Curtis had the slightest idea who he was. That the pair of them had crossed paths on the dark net on multiple occasions. That he was Nob, the man creeping closer to the inner circle of the website that Curtis worked for. That it was him who had sent the cocaine now sitting between them on the coffee table set up to gain access to his administrator account. Curtis sat there listening to the special agent. His insides turned to liquid, his heart rate increased, and his hands were sweating uncontrollably. Prison? That was the last place he wanted to go. His wife was out of town, and she had no idea what was happening. She wouldn't be able to pay the bills without him. He couldn't bear the thought of her struggling with the legal fees on her own. Would she return to the broken home and fear the worst? She'd warned him about the Silk Road countless times, but he always argued back. It's perfectly safe. I'm perfectly anonymous, he'd said. Would she remind him of that when she saw him in jail? Curtis, of course, agreed to comply with their requests, if that is what you could call it. He didn't seem to have much choice. They brought his laptop into the kitchen and asked him to sign into his Silk Road admin account, explaining everything as he went along. There were booby traps built into the process. If you didn't do things in a certain way, it would lock the account permanently. Dread Pirate Roberts was a smart and of course paranoid man. As he continued to explain what he was doing, it became clear that the two agents flanking him on both sides were not very technically savvy. They asked basic questions that even a teenager would be expected to know. These are the men who were gonna bring down DPR, he thought, though of course knew much better than to say it out loud. Carl Force was joined in the kitchen by a man called Sean Bridges who seemed to have a particular interest in the financial transactions of the Silk Road, and less about the method of communication with its mysterious owner. This process lasted a couple of hours before they seemed to be satisfied he was telling the truth, 
though of course they wouldn't allow him to touch the laptop without their presence, and a detailed explanation of what he was doing, as well as exactly what would happen after he did it, probably a way to make sure he wasn't leaving tips for his boss. As the interrogation came to an end, Curtis was led back to the living room by Special Agent Force, but Agent Bridges stayed in the kitchen, continuing to probe Curtis's laptop, which remained signed into the admin account. It was at this point that Curtis was hit with the reality of the situation. Despite complying with all demands, he was about to be taken to jail. Unexplainable panic set in. Please, please don't take me to jail. He knows everything about me. He could have me killed. Despite the protest of Curtis, Carl had let the police take him to processing. If he cared, which he didn't, it was still unavoidable. Life isn't a movie. If a SWAT team breaks into your house and seizes a kilogram of cocaine, you need to be processed and put into the system. The verbal agreement to help the case didn't change anything about that. As he sat in front of his computer, Carl Force felt the weight of his failure sinking in. He had played his hand with precision, but now his plan had hit a snag. Dread Pirate Roberts had detected some kind of issue with the Flush account, which was the nickname of Curtis Green, and Force had to act fast to salvage the situation. He couldn't understand exactly how this had happened. What was it that had tipped him off? It seemed like everything Curtis did had an explanation, but regardless of how it happened, it didn't really change anything. He needed to convince DPR that Curtis wasn't compromised, otherwise the admin account and all of this operation was absolutely for nothing. Force paced around his home office, his hooded jacket reminding him that he was now Nob, the narco, and not Call Force, the DEA agent. He had to think of a believable excuse to explain the inactivity, something that DPR would buy without raising suspicion. Maybe a power outage, a coffee spill that broke the laptop, internet going off, something that was benign. But he kept coming back to the same problem. None of this would matter if Curtis remained in jail. If DPR knew this man's identity and someone picked up on the arrest, the game was over before it started. Maybe DPR had connections inside the law, and if that was the case, no excuse would work. Maybe Curtis would even be killed in jail. That would, of course, be Carl's fault too. It wasn't the first time he'd played with people's lives, but this time, it felt different. He sat there wondering if he'd made the right decision by becoming Nob and going after DPR in this way. Was it worth it? Regardless, it was too late to back down now. He'd come too far to turn back. He took a deep breath, took off his hood, and resumed his role as a special agent for the DEA. He would personally take Curtis home, force him to smooth things over with DPR, and try to find out why he had disabled the admin account so quickly. The next few hours of his life were a trance, broken only by bouts of immense panic and fear. Curtis Green was transported to the local jail and processed into custody, stripped down and handed his uniform, then led to his future short-term home. He entered the stark, intimidating jail cell and felt a cold sweat trickle down his spine. Curtis knew he was out of his element completely, surrounded by hardened criminals who could smell fear from a mile away, and Curtis reeked. It didn't take long for the other inmates to stop prodding him for information and Curtis, eager to fit in, spilled his guts. Little did he know, he was playing with fire. As he recounted the story of his arrest, he saw the looks of suspicion and hostility in the eyes of his cellmates. He didn't understand why they were so on edge. He just kept talking and talking, spilling more and more about the special agent, the DEA, the Secret Service, and it wasn't until a burly inmate knocked into him muttering a warning in his ear that Curtis realised the danger he was in. How did he not understand that talking about special agents, federal organisation, and cooperation would set off alarm bells? They saw this man as a snitch, and what did they do to snitches in jail? They killed them. He spent the next few hours in a state of shock, clinging to his thin mattress and praying for his safety, reluctant to exit even for mealtime. Luckily, he wasn't there for long. Less than 24 hours later, the guards came to get him. As he walked with them out of the room, he looked around to see faces peeing back at him with what you could only describe as intent and hatred. He knew if he remained, or had to return to the same place, he might never leave again. Curtis arrived back at home to his wife and collapsed in her arms. He told her everything that had happened. He was entirely defeated. She assured him that it was over and they would be okay. And for the next few hours, she was right. That was until his phone rang and he heard the gruff, now familiar voice of Special Agent Carl Force. This was clearly just the beginning. Force was frustrated. He was having difficulty explaining to Curtis 
just how severe this situation was. Curtis seemed to think that now his admin account was useless, he was off the hook for any arrangement and could just go back to a normal life. In reality, and for whatever reason, Dread Pirate Roberts now thought that Curtis was compromised. The shroud of secrecy about the Silk Road boss allowed for imaginations to run wild about how bad this could be for Curtis. Carl's experience running down cartels allowed for some colourful and detailed explanation of the consequences for snitches in this drug world. He spent the next hour explaining that the only way to save himself and his family from a gruesome end was to convince DPR that things were fine. Log on to your other account, Chronic Pain, and just play dumb. Say your login details for Flush no longer worked, and you wondered if he could fix it. Pretend you have no idea he had even blocked your access, explained Carl, forcing a nice tone into his voice. He tried to assure Curtis that despite the extremes of their prior meeting, that he was one of the good guys and he could be trusted. That he, and he alone, would make sure Curtis was safe from the Silk Road Kingpin. This seemed to work. Curtis had agreed to try. Carl left his house shortly after, knowing he'd lied to Curtis, and that lie could result in a breaking story any day now. Man and wife in Utah, violently murdered in Spanish Fork suburban home. If DPR actually knew about the arrest, which nobody knew if he did, he would know that Curtis being free so soon would be due to federal intervention as an informant. To then go and blatantly lie to him to try and gain access to the admin account again would play their hand entirely. Curtis would be outed as a rat to a rich man whose website gave him deep connections to the criminal underworld across the entire planet. But that of course was out of Carl's control. All he could do was go back home, put on his hoodie and log into the Silk Road as Knob. If Carl couldn't figure out how DPR knew, maybe Knob could. The features of Curtis that made him a pushover in the world probably worked in his favour this time. Being mild-mannered and not at all intimidating, he managed quite easily to convince DPR that things were fine, that his absence was nothing out of the ordinary and would never be repeated without prior warning. His admin account flush had been reinstated, though of course with new login details, just in case. Curtis spent many hours sat in front of his computer screen, catching up on work he missed while otherwise occupied in jail. A thought crossed his mind on more than one occasion. Was he now a secret agent? He was undoubtedly living a double life. On the one hand, he was still playing his role as an administrator for the Silk Road, answering support tickets, keeping the marketplace running. And on the other hand, he was now an informant for the government, gathering information to take down the very same black market he'd helped for over a year. The weight of this new reality was almost suffocating, but he tried to focus on the familiar routine of life prior to the raid. He sipped his coffee and savoured the sweetness of the powdered donuts. He typed away at the support tickets, his mind on autopilot. Very few things actually changed, one of which he no longer went to the door to take in packages. If something was delivered, he ignored it until his wife returned home. Despite keeping his mind occupied, every now and then the enormity of what he was doing would hit him like a ton of bricks. He was going up against a man who had created a global empire with resources and connections that Curtis couldn't even imagine. And he was doing it all the while trying to protect himself and his family from the potential repercussions. Why had it even come to this? Curtis was a retired EMT. He joined the Silk Road with good intentions. Yeah, he sold some of his prescription painkillers sometimes to make a little extra money, but he also frequented the forums and gave advice on how to avoid overdoses, on which drugs to take, for which conditions, and just to genuinely help people out. He also was a believer. He believed in the vision of Silk Road. He believed in DPR. Easy access to drugs for those who couldn't get them by normal official means was something he supported wholeheartedly. There were things on the Silk Road, of course, that he disagreed with, such as guns and some services, but overall he saw it as a net positive for society. Which is exactly why when DPR personally approached him to help out with the administrative side, he jumped at the opportunity. The hiring process though, was why he was in this precarious position. To get access to the Silk Road backend, you had to send a picture of yourself holding your ID and a close-up of all the information to the Dread Pirate himself. This was a safety measure for anyone who would betray the captain and the crew. Maybe he would make the mutineer walk the plank. Curtis paused for a moment, taking a deep breath to steady himself. He couldn't let his fear paralyse him, not when so much was at stake. He reminded himself that he was doing the right thing, that he was helping to take down a dangerous criminal enterprise. 
This was the lie he often told himself. With that came renewed determination. He dove back into his work, not just answering support tickets, but proving to DPR he wasn't a threat. He knew that his actions would be under scrutiny. He knew there would be a million things that could go wrong, but he also knew that he had no choice but to continue. For now, at least, he had convinced the Dread Pirate Roberts that everything was okay, but it was only a matter of time before the truth came out. This thrilling case had turned into a tedious routine for Force. Back in his undercover days, he was living the life, indulging in drugs and violence, completely submerged in his role. That's exactly how he liked it. But now, he found himself in dull meetings with the task force, discussing their approach to capturing a mastermind who was always 10 steps ahead. They were playing by the rules, and there were no rules in this world. Carl's boss would scold him for incomplete logs from his late night conversations with DPR posing as Knob. This was something nobody even wanted in the first place. He didn't get permission, he just started doing it, and then to avoid losing his job or being kicked off the task force, he shared that this was what he was doing in his spare time. Though of course secretly, Force had grown fond of the elusive Silk Road boss. He admired his intelligence, his vision, and the no-nonsense attitude. Force spent his days bored, looking forward to the nightly chats, where he'd share his life as a Puerto Rican middleman for South American cartels, and DPR would seek his advice on avoiding law enforcement. They had grown so close in fact that DPR relied on Nob's security expertise, and Nob assured him that he could provide muscle whenever and wherever he needed, for the right price of course. He even created new accounts on the Silk Road to interact with the community forums and build new characters in case they would come in handy later. When Carl received an email from Secret Service agent Sean Bridges requesting a meeting with Curtis Green, Force couldn't wait. Any excuse to get away from the daily tedium that was the Marco Polo task force. Even if that meant talking to Curtis, a man he thoroughly despised for his pathetic, snivelling demeanour. With that, he picked up his jacket and set off to the meeting place, making sure to take his laptop to keep in contact with his new friend on the Silk Road. Curtis felt like he was in a nightmare as he sat in the passenger seat of the car, his dad next to him, silent for most of the long drive. He was not a pleasant man at the best of times, but after finding out what had happened to his son, he was furious. What would people think and say if this went public? The Secret Service, the DEA, drug dealers, his own son involved in it all, at the centre. He could hardly bring himself to look at Curtis. The only solution he could think was to help make sure this never went public. He would take Curtis to the meeting, where his lawyer waited to help him talk to the special agents, and after that, he was on his own. As they arrived at the hotel, the lawyer waited outside. Curtis exited the vehicle, and before he'd even closed the door, his dad was already driving away. Curtis greeted the stranger, who immediately told him not to worry. Just cooperate, and things would be fine. They entered the building and headed up to the room where the agents were waiting. Neither of them looked pleased to see Curtis, but a third man dressed in a suit seemed to at least feign pleasantries. For the next few hours, Curtis answered hundreds of questions to the best of his knowledge, most of which were the same as the day in his kitchen. His lawyer seemed to really be earning his fee by sitting there and just letting him speak. That is until he announced that he needed to leave. That's enough for today, suggested the man in the suit. They entered the elevator together and then split off into two groups. Curtis headed to the hotel restaurant with Sean Bridges and Carl Force, and the other two walking outside of the building. As Force watched Curtis choke down his steak and fries, he couldn't help but feel a sense of disgust. This man was a liability and a burden, and he was stuck with him. After finishing his meal, Force opened his laptop to quell any attempt at conversation Curtis may try to start. He found himself on the Silk Road, logged in as Knob. To his surprise, a message was waiting for him from DPR. An employee has been stealing from me. I'm talking about a substantial sum of money. Who was it? Knob replied. DPR answered almost immediately with the name Flush. I need to recover that money. You said you had muscle all over the country. Is this something you can facilitate? Carl Force peered over the top of the laptop screen directly into the face of Curtis. Into the face of Flush. There's no way this man stole the money. He would shit his pants at the mere thought of it. You stole money from Silk Road? Carl asked him, totally out of the blue. Curtis began to stammer some response, not quite outraged by the accusation, but totally dumbfounded. Carl continued speaking to DPR, asking how he knew it was flush, to which he provided logs 
that were irrefutable. It was certainly Curtis. The next message contained the ID that Flush had sent to DPR, securing his trust during the hiring process. I want you to scare him into returning the funds. Failing that, beat him until he does. This was the first time Carl had seen the dark side of DPR, but of course he wasn't surprised. This all made sense from the perspective of an underground drug kingpin. This did, however, throw a wrench in the works of the meticulous plan that Carl and Task Force had for Curtis. They all knew this man had been a liability from the start, and now he was causing even more trouble. Force was determined to get the job done, no matter what it took. But how could he change this? How could he use the situation to his advantage? The questions were more like accusations. Curtis could feel his meal ready to exit his body at any moment, an adverse effect of the sudden onset of terror. The questions were bad. Silence between them were worse. But now, after furiously typing for five or so minutes, the face of the man across from him was changing. In real time, he saw confusion turn to contemplation and then to sinister. Change your plans, Curtis, the man said, his face ominously illuminated by the artificial white glow of the laptop screen. What do you mean? He stammered. It seems that DPR wants you dead, so we've got to make sure he doesn't succeed. That means we need to make you disappear. Curtis couldn't believe what he was hearing disappear. Before he could finish the thought, another man spoke. Cut the bullshit, said Sean, a man who you could have forgotten was present in any room due to his lack of involvement. To say he had few words was an understatement. You stole the money. Admit it. This didn't seem like a regular accusation. He was incredibly aggressive in the assertion. Curtis knew better, of course, than to respond. Instead, he sat in silence looking down at his empty plate. It was Carl Force that cut the silence. It doesn't matter. It won't change the plans. Whether you took it or not, DPR thinks you did, so we're gonna have to hurt you. After finishing his conversation with DPR, Nob had a new set of instructions, and with it came a new plan. He was making everything up as he went along, but that is a skill that you sharpen like a blade when working undercover. Thinking on your feet and adapting to a situation within a second's notice is not just useful, but the difference between life and death in his line of work. How quickly do you think you can get someone over there? And what exactly would that cost me? Asked DPR. The employee, as he was referred to, Curtis, as he knew him, had allegedly stolen $350,000 in Bitcoin from the escrow wallet across a handful of transactions. And that's not DPR's money. That's seller's money. The Silk Road Marketplace escrow system worked as follows. When you buy a product from a seller, you deposit money into a wallet owned by the Silk Road. When you confirm delivery, they release the payment to the seller. The Silk Road admins oversaw settling the frequent disputes or overriding this mechanism when necessary. That was the job of Flush, or Curtis. So of course, he needed access to this Bitcoin wallet. Back at the hotel room, the three men re-entered the suite and Force began to set up a camera and tripod in the bathroom. He turned and saw Curtis almost cowering in the entrance, looking utterly confused. Force led him into the room and filled the tub with warm water. This has to look real, he gestured towards the bathtub. I'm gonna hold your head under, then we're gonna take pictures for proof. As he explained, Carl knew that Curtis wasn't listening, or at least not understanding. What he was trying to explain was that they were going to have to torture him, though using that word would have been a bad idea. Oh well, he grabbed Curtis by the shirt and forced him towards the now full tub of water. As he held Curtis's head under, the man struggled and flailed. A natural response when trying to stay alive. But Force was staging a murder, and he was strong. So he remained exactly where he wanted him. DPR had asked Nob to find the thief and torture him. And then, a detail he didn't tell anyone else, dispose of him. As a federal agent, he of course wasn't going to kill Curtis, but he needed to make it look like he had. After a few hits to the face and some time being drowned, he was almost ready. Next, he told Curtis to get on the ground face down, and Carl Force opened a tin of Campbell's Chicken and Stars soup and dumped the contents onto his face, shirt, and the floor. Now play dead, said Carl, as he snapped his picture, ready to send to DPR when the time was right. What no one in that room knew was that for this job, Nob accepted an upfront payment of $80,000 in Bitcoin, a fact he would not share in his report to the task force or his bosses at the DEA. He was playing with fire, but at least that's what he was good at. After, easily, the most horrific night of his life, Curtis was done. He was too numb to complain, and too broken to protest. Everything was just a daze. They told him that the torture had to look real, and it did, because it was real. 
Curtis felt completely in the dark about everything. How did the DEA agent know that DPR wanted him dead? How did Carl Force know so much? But he knew better than to ask these questions. Force had explained to Curtis that his only concern now should be to play along. Timing is everything, Force had told him. He thinks you're a thief. Your logging credentials still work, but only to avoid spooking you into hiding. He's put out a hit on you. He's letting you act like everything is fine until the hitmen find you. So you're gonna act like nothing happened and you'll work like normal. You'll wait until I call you. Then when I tell you to stop, you stop. You stop everything. Curtis had to close all the curtains, tell his immediate family to avoid talking to strangers, never to mention his welfare. He would need to remain a ghost, never sign into any of his socials, never answer the phone, never go outside even in his own yard. He needed to act as if he didn't exist, because if he didn't, that might become the reality. Act like a dead man or become one. He might have protested to this idea or some of the rules if it wasn't for the fact that he just experienced firsthand the terrible punishment he and his family might endure if he didn't play this role perfectly. Curtis was instructed to only speak on the phone to one person, Carl Force, his lifeline and connection to the outside world. Also, a man who seemed to hate his very existence. Carl couldn't shake the feeling that something was amiss. Curtis, that snivelling loser stealing 350 large from a man like DPR, he couldn't get it out of his head. It made no sense. Curtis was the one who told him DPR would have him killed just for being arrested. That he had a copy of his real ID including the home address where his wife slept every night. That same guy just decided to steal 350 grand and then stay in that same address as if nothing happened. It just didn't add up. Was DPR playing a game? Did he know who Nob was and was laying a trap? Was there a third party involved in the cat and mouse? Force knew he was walking a dangerous line, but he had come too far to turn back now. His dealings with Curtis and DPR were strictly off the books now, and he couldn't risk the task force discovering what he'd been doing. The only other person he had to worry about was Sean Bridges, but he was present for the event and he didn't say anything or try to intervene. He just sat in the hotel room perusing Curtis's laptop. If he reported anything, he would also implicate himself. Carl decided to switch to alternate forms of communication with DPR from now on. His bosses still required him to turn in chat logs of his DPR interactions every day, so he devised a system. He would speak of regular things when on his knob Silk Road account, and then tell DPR to swap to communication via PGP, an encrypted form of communication, when discussing more personal matters. Things had quickly gotten out of hand. A few days after leaving Curtis at the hotel, Nob logged in and sent an encrypted message to DPR which contained an image. Curtis laying lifeless on a bathroom floor. His heart gave out during the interrogation. We didn't manage to recover any funds, was the message accompanying the picture. Cole didn't admit it to himself, but this was the end of his conflict of interest. He now wasn't playing for either side, the law enforcement or the Silk Road. He was playing for himself. Nob had come up with a new plan to extort money from DPR, and it involved none other than a corrupt task force agent called Kevin, another alter ego that Carl Force had created. Ironically, Kevin was just Carl, but with a different name, as he, just like Kevin, was now a corrupt task force agent. Kevin contacted DPR and offered information that would help him avoid capture, sharing the secrets only someone on the Marco Polo task force designated to capture the Silk Road Kingpin would have known. Over the next few months, Kevin had been paid over $750,000 in Bitcoin for actionable intelligence. Earlier in his career, Carl had fallen into the dark as an undercover agent, becoming addicted to drugs and working for himself, sometimes against his own agency. This wasn't new to him, but this time, the stakes were higher than ever before. There was no telling how it would end, but he needed to enrich himself before it did. Curtis gazed at the screen of his phone, which was now his only lifeline to the outside world. The number of special agent call force was the only one he dialed or answered. But even that felt like a lifeline to a different world, one that was far away from his current reality. The days blurred together in an endless cycle of isolation, fear and anxiety. Curtis had given up trying to sleep as every noise made him jump, but he also felt like he was in a constant state of exhaustion. His life had been reduced to a mere shadow of what it used to be. He longed for the days he could go outside without the fear of his previous boss ending his life. Despite the circumstances, Curtis clung onto a shred of hope that things would get better. He stuck to the plan as best he could, 
though he did find himself breaking the rules from time to time. He logged onto his old message boards and contacted admins he knew personally, creating new accounts and begging them to keep his identity a secret. It was a small comfort, but it was at least something. His wife tried to bring him a sense of normalcy by ordering takeout from their favourite restaurant, but it was never quite the same as it used to be. Being there, the atmosphere, freshly cooked. It was as if all the joy had been sucked out of life, leaving only a hollow shell behind. Curtis knew he couldn't keep living like this forever, but he didn't know how to escape. There wasn't really a choice. He felt like he was trapped in a cage, and the key to his freedom was held by somebody else. His only solace was the belief that eventually they would catch the kingpin of the dark web. But even that hope was fading. The kingpin was too smart, too cunning. Curtis wondered if they would ever catch him, and what if they didn't? Would he just have to live like this forever, or would something worse happen? Force's heart was pounding in his chest as he read the email. The Marco Polo task force will stand down for one week. They only did that when there was a high risk of jeopardising an ongoing operation. He knew that Marco Polo was not the only task force chasing the Silk Road operators, there were three or four across the country who had the same mandate. They didn't share resources and often butted heads on jurisdiction. This had never happened before though. They must be real close to capturing DPR if they want everyone else to stop what they're doing in case they jeopardise it. Carl wasn't worried about missing out on the glory of capturing the man himself, that ship had long sailed. He wanted it in the beginning, but now there were bigger problems. He was terrified that if caught, DPR's computer would contain the unencrypted message logs that would lead back to his double agent lifestyle. He was working against the federal government, accepting payments to be a rat for a drug kingpin that he was tasked to chase. It was either the messages or the Bitcoin transactions he'd been laundering through the Mt. Gox Bitcoin exchange that would lead back to him. The thought of being caught made him feel sick to his stomach. Never had his life been on the line in such a way, something that was completely out of his hands. Physical violence was one thing, he could handle that. Life behind bars was another. He logged into the knob account and composed a message to DPR. He had to be very careful with his words. He couldn't come right out and say he was the informant, but he had to warn him. My informant is certain that you are going to be identified in court. You are like one of my family. But I must tell you that I've had several people killed who were sent to jail. It is very easy and cheap. I trust that you've destroyed all messages, chats, etc. between us. He hesitated for a moment, then hit send. Perhaps threatening a man he considered a friend was a bad idea, especially if he was wrong and they didn't capture him. This was a bridge burning act, but he had no time to come up with a better solution and he was already operating multiple sock puppet accounts that were relaying information to DPR for Bitcoin payments in any case. Knob only needed to exist to give the illusion to his bosses that Carl continued to try to solicit information from DPR in aid of his capture. At this point he'd done all he could. Now. It was a waiting game. It sounds like the plot of a movie. A U.S. man was able to hide behind a false identity, operating a sophisticated illegal drug website. The site operated much like eBay. It allowed users to buy and sell illegal drugs, guns, and even hire hitmen. The FBI spent two years trying to find the man behind the site. He couldn't believe what he was seeing. His heart was pounding as he stared at the television screen in complete disbelief. The news anchor's voice seemed to echo in his head, as he tried to process what was going on. The infamous mastermind behind the Silk Road, the world's largest online black market, has been apprehended by the FBI. The TV remote slipped from Curtis's hand. He sank to his knees and wept. Was it finally over? After months of living like a prisoner in his own home, the constant fear for his family's safety on his mind every second of every day, was this the end of it all? He couldn't help but wonder if the man they arrested was really the person known as Dread Pirate Roberts. He looked too young, too soft to be such a hard and cruel man. How could this Ross Ulbrick be the one he feared so much? After a few minutes, he gathered his thoughts and reached for the phone. The only way to get answers was to call his lifeline. He dialed Call Force's number. After all, he still needed to follow protocol. No outside contact except for Carl. No answer. He tried again, and again. Each time met with the same result. Maybe he was at the operation, he couldn't bear the thought of being left in the dark once again. He had come to rely on Carl, even considering him a friend, despite his cold treatment. He settled down and did all he could. After the FBI had captured Ross William Albright, the agents returned to the New York field office with a treasure trove of evidence, including the contents of the Dread Pirate Robert's private laptop. They managed to grab it from him while he was still logged in, giving them access to everything they needed to bring down the entire operation. The laptop contained a diary written by the creator of the Silk Road, financial records, and information on other individuals who had been involved in the illegal marketplace. 
The IRS and the FBI spent weeks sifting through the information, tracing Bitcoin transactions, and revealing a tangled web considerably larger than anyone could have ever imagined. They also found something curious. Millions of dollars in Bitcoin were missing from Ulbricht's account. The IRS special investigator took special interest in this, running down leads until the money traced back to a federal employee, Secret Service agent Sean Bridges. He had transferred hundreds of thousands of dollars to himself from Curtis Green's administrator account, which had access to the Silk Road Bitcoin escrow on the day of the raid at his home. That didn't explain the rest of the money though, until they discovered the murder for hire plot between Ross Ulbrich and Carl Force of the DEA. Following that same thread led them to his multiple sock puppet accounts that were selling task force and federal intelligence to DPR for cash payments. When the agents found evidence of these transactions, Carl Force turned himself in. He wasn't going to live a life on the run. Bridges, however, attempted to erase his laptop and flee the country. He was apprehended at an international airport with cash, his service pistol, bulletproof vest, and fake documents. In the end, both men were arrested and sentenced to prison. As for Curtis Green, he faced charges related to cocaine possession and his involvement in the Silk Road. He spent months waiting for trial, months of believing he may go to federal prison despite him living a personal hell after what he thought was cooperation with an active investigation, but eventually the judge ruled that Curtis Green for his crimes wouldn't face prison. Instead, time served. The court could not ignore the treatment he had received from the two dirty federal agents, and he eventually wrote a book about his experiences with Silk Road, sold merchandise, gave interviews, and attended podcasts. The claims in his book and his portrayal of events are widely contested by all involved, and overall paint him in a far different light than other evidence suggests. Over the next year, all those who had worked with Dread Pirate Roberts were arrested and charged with various crimes. Every lieutenant that did his dirty work eventually wound up behind bars. The Silk Road was seized and shut down, but within days, new websites appeared to fill the void. To this day, dark web illegal marketplaces operate, some as big or bigger than the Silk Road, but none of them facing the same scrutiny. As we conclude this singular story of the overall Silk Road saga, of which there are many, we are left with one haunting truth. Ross Ulbrich, the once feared Dread Pirate Roberts, now rots in a federal prison, destined to die in those concrete walls.